Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone uh, for joining us here at Mass Peace Action. This is uh, another one of our famous uh, webinars. This one uh, is sponsored by the Middle East Working Group of Massachusetts uh, Peace Action. And you are watching the COVID-19 emergency in Iran, uh, the reality on the ground, and the role of US sanctions. So we all know uh, that we're dealing with the global pandemic of the coronavirus uh, right now. And one of the countries that has been most affected uh, by the virus is Iran. Uh, so tonight uh, we are going to explore uh, the extent of the pandemic uh, ravaging Iran right now and also examine the role being played by uh, US sanctions and how they are making the situation uh, worse uh, in Iran. Um, we have two fantastic panelists tonight. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Amin Fazpour, Faz, Fazpour, sorry uh, for my mispronunciation. Uh, he is the founder uh, and the manager of the Iran Circle. Uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, in Boston. It's a, a session series focused on hosting uh, academics and scholars uh, to present their Iran-related research uh, in Farsi uh, to the Iranian uh, public for long-term cultural uh, development for Iranian society. We're also joined uh, by Don with with Donna Farvard, uh, who is the National Organizing Director of NIAC, uh, the National Iranian American Council, NIAC Action, actually. Uh, so she oversees the organization's National Grassroots Field Program. Uh, and for the past three years, she has been working to organize and empower uh, Iranian Americans uh, across the country to promote peace and diplomacy with Iran. Uh, something that is much needed uh, in these dire times. Um, we all know that uh, tensions are incredibly high between the United States and Iran. And what we need to do now uh, in the midst of this crisis against the coronavirus uh, is to make sure that these tensions do not continue to ratchet up. Uh, what we need now is global cooperation to fight our common enemy, enemy which is the coronavirus. Uh, the last thing we need is another brutal and unnecessary conflict uh, between the United States and a country in the Middle East. Uh, we simply cannot afford it. Uh, so first we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Faiz Poor uh, about the, about the, the numbers uh, in Iran and the extent uh, to which coronavirus is affecting that country. Uh, he's done a lot of uh, fantastic research on the subject, and it will give us a, a good base of knowledge uh, on what we're actually dealing with uh, with coronavirus in Iran. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to the doctor uh, so he can uh, enlighten us. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian, for the introduction. Let me um, share my screen with you. Oh, I think I cannot uh, share my screen right now. If you can fix that, Brian. That's, that's okay. Yep. I just uh, remade your co-host. You can share your screen now. There we go. Let's see. Okay. I hope everyone can see my slides, which I'm going to go back to the very first slide. Absolutely, we can see them. Okay. All right. Great. So, um, as you can see, uh, so I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm uh, I'm in Facebook. Um, <clears throat> I'm a um, research scientist by training. Um, and I'm also uh, the manager of the Iran Circle in Boston uh, as a session series. Um, and uh, today I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna tell you about uh, the COVID-19 catastrophe in Iran and tell you the, 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 the researches that have been recently 
done and published on this uh, on this matter and the real numbers of uh, of the infection and and death cases in the country um, that are that are um, drastically different with the with the numbers that are uh, officially announced. Uh, but before that, uh, I wanted to tell you why should an American um, really care about this? Why, why should they uh, be really worried about this? Um, so uh, I wanted to tell you about the, the, the historical sources of conflict between Iran and the USA. Um, <clears throat> so in 1953, uh, the United States sponsored the coup against the democratically elected prime minister of Iran, Dr. Mossadegh, uh, who attempted to nationalize the Iranian oil industry, which uh, eventually in 1978 resulted in the, in the revolution in Iran. Uh, between 1980 and 1988, the United States supported Saddam Hussein and Iraq uh, in the imposed war on the post-revolutionary Iran, which resulted in 200,000 cases of death uh, in Iran only. Uh, in 1988, the United States shot down an Iranian passenger plane over the Persian Gulf, which uh, resulted in uh, which the plane was carrying 290 Iranian passengers. And then this list goes on until just recently, in 2020, um, uh, the, um, the Trump administration uh, administration. Uh, assassinates an Iranian official in, in Iraq near Baghdad, which results in another passenger passenger plane being shot down by the intimidate, intimidated Iranian forces, uh, which again results in 176 uh, lives uh, being taken away, in addition to many more inside Iran for, uh, for related reasons at that time. A few months ago, we, we all remember. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, the most recent case is uh, imposing the most severe sanctions at the time of the catastrophic uh, COVID-19 pandemic, about which I'm gonna um, talk uh, a little more soon. But before that, I wanted to just um, make sure that we um, understand that why this is important for, for an American citizen to know because you know, these are, it's important to know that these are what have caused anti-American sentiments in the Iranian society during the past 70 years in a, cumul in a cumulative uh, way, which, have been, which has been uh, abused by, by internal radical forces for undermining democracy and peace in favor of personal ideologies. And I'm not specifying in which country it is being abused. Now, is this where an American citizen would prefer her or his tax dollars to be spent? That is, that is a really important question to, to, to be asked. Now, back to the issue of COVID-19 and, the, and the, the numbers. The current uh, official statistics of COVID-19 in Iran are 85,000 85, cases of infection and 5,000 cases of death. Now, what is the truth? Uh, we want to know the truth. Uh, are these numbers um, actually real? Does this show the actual number of uh, infected and dead people um, inside the country or not? Now, how do we know the truth? If I, if I tell you that the temperature of this water um, is 70 degrees, you, you, may, you may ask me, is this really 70 degrees or or is it a little different? Um, you may go, go ahead and grab a few thermometers, um, perform a few independent measurements, right? And tell me precisely, really, what is the objective truth about the temperature of that water with a, with a proper error bar, right? That is called the scientific method. Now, that is what I was gonna do today to, to basically tell you guys um, about the about the, the actual numbers of COVID-19 in Iran. Now, is this a specific to Iran or is this a general problem? No, this is a totally general problem. This is not just about Iran. Um, a few, an, an article was published in the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine a few days ago <coughs> by a group of physicians in, the, in Columbia University Irving Medical Center uh, in New York. 
<clears throat> that showed uh, that that is suggesting that um, that the real number of the COVID-19 infections in the in the New York City is about one um, is more than one million people, ten times higher than the official statistics. Now, why is that? The simple explanation is that when we have a low capacity of testing, when we are not testing most of the people, and and because this uh, this disease tends to be asymptomatic in most of the cases, as you can see here. 13.5% uh, of the population has been completely asymptomatic. No one would have known that they had the disease if they had not gone to the hospital. So this is a general problem and, and it happens anywhere uh, when you have a low capacity for testing. It, it's, a, it's an inherent property of this disease. Now I'm gonna show you um, <clears throat> a research article that was published on this um, um, two, about two, three weeks ago, or, or about a month ago, uh, which was published uh, by Dr. Rafwar Zadegan and Dr. Rahman Dot from Virginia Tech and MIT, two very um, well-known professors in their own fields, um, and, and experienced, in fact, in, in modeling of pandemics. Uh, so this is a simplified um, version of the model. So what they do uh, is that they, they basically categorize the population into susceptible uh, people, exposed people, infected, recovered, and dead, right? And then, and then they take all sorts of factors and parameters into account to make sure that the, their model is, is accurate. Um, the, uh, some of the factors that they take into account uh, are social distancing, or test coverage, right? the fraction of diagnosed people, contact rate, which is, which is a function of the social distancing and, and many, many other parameters. But I wanted to point out that two of the parameters that, that we could potentially control are uh, the test coverage, like how many tests we do uh, per one million people, and the social distancing. These are the things that we can control. What we cannot control is the virus itself, right? So what did, they, uh, what did they find after developing this model and after testing it on real available data um, out there and making sure that the model is actually working and showing the real numbers out there? They found that the number of um, infected people by, the end, by March 20th was 1 million people in the country. That was, twen uh, that was the... For, um, uh, uh, the, the official number for that was 20,000. So this is like a 50 fold difference between the official statistics and the real numbers inside the country. For death uh, and on, on March 20th, there, was, uh, there has been 15, uh, there was 15,000 cases of death while the official statistics, the official number was 1,500. So you can, you can see how different uh, uh, the official numbers and the real numbers based on scientific calculation are. Now, um, they use their model to predict what is going to happen in the future under several different scenarios. And these scenarios basically are including uh, the effect of seasonal changes, like if, if the disease would go away by changes in the weather, and also uh, policy um, effects, like if we, if we um, uh, enforce social distancing, how would that change the result? Uh, so in the most optimistic case, they predicted that by the end of June, we will have uh, 1.5 million cases of infection in Iran and uh, about 50,000 cases of death. That is the most optimistic scenario. Now, in more realistic cases, where if the government cannot really handle this, uh, we will end up with something near 90,000 90, cases of death by the end of June. Now, you may say that, okay, this is just one research study. Um, how do we know that if this is actually to tell us the objective reality out there? Okay, there was, um, there was this other research study, study that, that came out like um, one or two weeks after the previous one, completely uh, independent, independent of the, the previous one. 
by two uh, experts in this field again who uh, who work um, in fact in, in IMF International uh, Monetary Fund uh, Agency and uh, what they showed was that by so you can see on the on the left plot that the ICU bed uh, capacity in Iran is 14,000 uh, beds right and the total number of hospital beds in Iran is 170,000 beds. So based on their calculations, which basically they, they um, um, used a very similar model to the previous um, um, study, because that is what is typically used for, for performing these predictions, um, they, they showed that by April 26, the country in the, the baseline model, if no, um, if nothing is planned to prevent this from happening, uh, by April 26, uh, the country is going to run out of ICU beds. And by May 26, in about one month from now, the country is going to run out of uh, the total number of hospital beds. And, and, and if that happens, by mid-June, we will have uh, 15,000 deaths per day in Iran. And this is going to result in 900,000 Iranians to die from COVID-19 by the end of the year. Now, let's take a pause and think for a second, who doesn't seem to mind this? I was thinking that who doesn't really mind this are those who feed on the sanctions-based balance of power locally and internationally. Politicians who don't desire progressive democratic social movements. Those who don't mind to see people's misery, right? All right, now back to that research study. What if social distancing and intensive testing is applied to prevent that uh, catastrophe from happening? Now we can see that uh, on the left, the more social distancing, the, the, the higher levels, the higher the levels of social distancing in the society, of course, the lower uh, the total number of deaths will be. Um, so in the, uh, in, in, if we have 75% um, um, isolation in the society, we will end up with something around 100,000 cases of death by the end of the year. And, uh, and, if we, and if we combine the social distancing with intensive testing, a really high capacity of testing, which means something around 10 to 15% of the population being tested, uh, which right now that number is at, at about 0.5%, like really far away from, from uh, optimal, uh, we could uh, keep the total number of people that are in need for ICU beds below the capacity. In Iran, right? Now, what if the government has to stop this um, this policies of social distancing and and open up the the businesses, which the Iranian government is already doing? Then the the total numbers of the people that are in need, uh, the total number of infection, of course, and then the total number of the people that are in need for ICU beds is going to uh, again go above. Uh, the capacity and, and that's going to result in um, something uh, around, uh, as you can see, uh, 150,000 cases of death by the end of the year. Now, uh, to close down um, my talk, um, I wanted to just review what are causing the catastrophic death rates in Iran. A pre, uh, so the two major reasons are the premature removal of social distancing policies because of government's inability to pay unemployment wages due to economic pressures and the lack of knowledge of real statistics due to the lack of enough testing capacity. And the other is healthcare systems fatigue, inability to quickly import vital medical technologies and the inability to quickly request service for important medical devices. Now, if these are not addressed immediately, these will cause hundreds of thousands of deaths in Iran by the end of the year. The Iranian society is not going to forget how the American superpower behaved in 2020, good or bad. 
no one and and i and i want to remind all of us here that no one is really asking for a favor we are only asking for removal of unjust warlike pressure at the time of a natural disaster this would be this would be not only fair based on human rights but would also save american tax dollars in the future it's really important to remember that iranians people people that i know they love america they love americans they love democracy they love freedom they they, they have no problem with the united states we should just stop giving them reasons for hating the United States. That's all we have to do. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Fiaspor. It, it, uh, it, it really goes to show how important uh, what we do right now is it, just the, the differences that you laid out uh, between how many lives uh, could, be, could be lost uh, if nothing is done and how many lives could be saved uh, if we change course. Uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right in, in saying that uh, the people of Iran will remember uh, what the what what the United States government uh, and its people uh, do in this time. Uh, we're going to use this crisis to, to make things worse and put pressure on the people of Iran, or are we going to do the moral thing and uh, do what's right for, for the people of Iran and for American taxpayers as well uh, to try and save lives and, and limit this virus. So we need to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that we do the right thing so that the implications of what we do now uh, don't haunt us for a generation to come. And with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Donna Favard, who, who can fill us in on, on what NIAC, the National Iranian American Council, is up to these days, and, and how we can make that change in policy a reality. Um, so please take it away, Donna. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I think, you know, before I go into um, what we've been working on on the policy side, I want to acknowledge that sanctions are a very wonky issue. Um, I advocate um, for removing sanctions daily, and I still think it's a wonky issue. Um, but I just constantly remember the words that one of my old bosses once told me. Uh, which is that if you don't need to be an expert about an issue to be an advocate about that issue. You don't need to know every single small detail about U.S. sanctions on Iran to know that they are wrong, to know that they are economic warfare, and to know that especially now during the time of coronavirus, rather than increasing maximum pressure and seeing the virus as an opportunity to ratchet up warfare, um, and, and quite frankly, advance an imperialistic foreign policy that the Trump administration has been pushing since they have taken office, uh, that we really do need global cooperation. Um, and part of that global cooperation is to make sure that Iranians have the basic access to medicine and hygienic equipment, um, and that the United States is not getting in the way of them getting access to that basic equipment. So uh, with that, we have been working on a couple of different um, policy approaches uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, number one is that the, the big ticket solution um, that we're looking at, um, and, and keep in mind this is a, you know, a, a temporary time bound solution, is to suspend um, Iran sanctions uh, for at least 120 days um, or until the peak of this pandemic and the crisis has subsided. Um, now, there is precedent for the United States um, to suspend sanctions during times of crisis. Um, Presidents Bush and Obama both lifted sanctions for 90 days each after major earthquakes that happened in Iran during their administration. 
So this isn't something that we're asking for that's never happened before. The Treasury Department does have the precedent to you know, suspend sanctions, to show goodwill to the Iranian people, and to help, especially now during what is a global crisis. Um, we have seen that um, there's a, a general unwillingness to do so so far um, just by asking them to suspend sanctions, right? So the Treasury has done some half-step measures where they have uh, suspended some explicit humanitarian sanctions, um, but obviously those sanctions on Iran's banking sector um, and other parts of the economy, like the oil sector, um, have really not only impacted Iran's economy and the Iranian people's basic ability to have the income to access medicine, food, and hygienic equipment, um, but also has made it difficult for Iran to purchase the, the equipment they need to battle the pandemic. Um, so we have tried to put pressure on the Trump administration in a number of different ways. Um, so we were involved in, in leading a letter um, with uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Sanders, a couple of other progressive champions in Congress calling on the Treasury to suspend sanctions. Um, there were actually two letters that were sent, one by camera letter, so from both House and Senate representatives that um, these progressive leaders put forward, and then another um, letter led by Senator Murphy that was just signed by uh, 10 senators that called for a very similar thing. So overall, we've gotten over 40 members of Congress to call on the Treasury to, to take this action. And for us, this is pretty significant because um, most other letters to the administration uh, that is specific to Iran sanctions tend to get maybe a dozen signers. Um, so we've demonstrated that this pandemic is so widespread and so alarming and really is the common enemy to the point that members of Congress that wouldn't normally sign a letter like this have actually added their name on. Um, we also are, have been a part of the um, end COVID sanctions campaign. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the voices calling to suspend sanctions aren't isolated within Congress, but are also widespread amongst the American public. Um, so we've worked with, um, it's called the No War Campaign. We've worked with this campaign to get end COVID sanctions ha uh, hashtag trending on Twitter. Twitter for a day pretty early on in the campaign. Uh, we've also used it to get um, folks to call uh, OFAC um, and really bug their lines, asking why they have yet to suspend sanctions during this time. Um, it actually got to the point, so we used an auto dialer uh, that one of our partner organizations had set up to patch through calls from constituents to OFAC. Um, and OFAC had gotten so many calls that they had blocked the number, the patch through number. Um, so clearly we're sending a pretty strong message to them that the American public is concerned about this. Um, and we've seen that this immense amount of pressure has shifted the Treasury Department to do a couple of things um, and bend under this pressure. Now they haven't done exactly what we wanted them to do but recently they, um, they published a list of guidelines that quite frankly were not very good and are very complicated, um, thinking that by publishing guidelines that they are showing that of course we're not blocking the ability for Iran to get humanitarian aid. Um, in reality, it, it produced the opposite effect for many because it was so wonky, because you had to click on 35 different links to figure out whether or not you can send aid to Iran. Um, but we think that they actually wouldn't have put up these guidelines unless there was a lot of public and congressional pressure put on them. So clearly pressure is um, a, a tactic or a strategy that has um, been pushing us in the right direction but hasn't gotten us all the way. Um, now, because we know that the Trump administration is um, engaging in a maximum pressure campaign that they wouldn't, you know, out of the goodness of their heart just suspend sanctions on Iran. Um, we want to be taking every avenue possible. So we've also been discussing 
with some members of Congress, the potential to include um, suspending sanctions into the next coronavirus stimulus package. Um, now, this is still in conversation. There isn't anything concrete that's come out of it yet. Um, but there are conversations between some of the progressive members who signed on to that letter that I'd mentioned before um, and with House leadership currently to make sure that this is something that could get included in um, the May stimulus package. Um, so there isn't much of an update other than there are conversations, but we think that the more that people are calling on Congress, uh, whether that is through signing an action alert or actually picking up the phone and hoping that the, <laughs> the congressional office's patch-through system is actually working so that their staff get the phone calls, um, but that we really are showing these members of Congress that we want them to make this a priority in the next stimulus package. Um, the concern is that um, the more that the United States is saddled with um, coronavirus, right, the more that we're impacted, the less likely we or even Congress are to be able to take the steps we need to suspend sanctions on Iran. We're less likely to actually think about our global, well, Iran's not a partner, but um, other countries outside of the United States and how coronavirus is impacting them if we ourselves are trying to battle the pandemic. So the longer we wait, the more that they push the, you know, the promise of putting something, putting this kind of language in a stimulus package, the less likely it is that we will actually see that language there in the future. Um, and quite frankly, the more lives we're losing every single day. Um, so the, the big thing that folks on this webinar can do is to make sure to write that letter, make sure that your members of Congress are hearing from you, that this is something that you want them to be prioritizing in the next stimulus, um, the more likely we are to, to get House leadership to uh, take the actions that we need them to take. Um, so that's a very basic overview on what we have been working on right now. I'm happy to answer any other questions that folks might have. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. I really appreciate that uh, presentation and those uh, action steps. And uh, just to let everyone know, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar and including uh, those phone numbers and action steps that you can take that Donna just listed. But uh, I, I want to get to your questions. Uh, Paul is going to be fielding uh, some of the questions for us. Uh, and I'm sure we have some of our own that we're going to sneak in there as well. But uh, Paul, would you like to uh, chime in and read off some of the questions from our audience members? Well, the first two were just a couple of uh, quick questions, uh, clarifying questions. One is, a question is, what is OPAC? <laughs> That's to Donna. What is OPAC? And then to I mean, uh, will the slides be available to people uh, after the presentation? So Donna, you want to start first what OPAC is? Yeah, OPAC. Um, so I always forget what the individual letters stand for, but when you think of OPAC, think of the, um, the entity within the, tr the US Treasury Department that um, facilitates um, the licenses that you would need to circumvent sanctions, right? So if you're thinking sanctions enforcement, you'll think of OPAC. Okay, thank you. And then now, uh, Brian, I think you said the number for, uh, for people can call there. Uh, one of the questions is how can we get that number and because uh, a particular group might be interested in making a bunch of calls. So yeah, it sounds like we already have uh, activists on the webinar who are ready to uh, keep those phone lines busy. Uh, yet yeah, OFAC is the Office of uh, Foreign Assets Control. Yes, I can see Stefania's very excited to flood their office with calls. Uh, so I will be providing the number uh, in the chat and also in a, in a follow-up uh, email as well. But I'm, but I'm interested uh, just to, to follow up um, in, 
you know, what the best way to keep the pressure on, you know, what are some of the best things that we, people can mention in the call when they're leaving a message? Um, what, what do you think would, would really change hearts and minds uh, over there at OFAC? Yeah, um, so we, uh, so a really quick thing for you to know is that if you call OFAC and leave a message, they use a tracking system where they'll find out who you are and call you back. Um, so just a heads up, don't be alarmed if that happens to you. Um, this is actually part of the reason why we did a patch through number for the campaign while I was running, uh, because we do know our community is vulnerable to OFAC. Uh, so we wanted to make sure folks were anonymized. Um, but again, don't be alarmed if OFAC calls you back to try to talk to you about your concern. Um, that is likely to happen, whether or not you leave your phone number behind for them. Uh, now, in terms of changing hearts and minds, uh, I think it's very unlikely that you will do so. I do think that a lot of folks who um, work at OFAC, like they're on the administrative le level, right? Like not the, the heads or the tops um, who help dictate policy or anything like that, but the folks who kind of do the day-to-day -day, um, work, oftentimes these folks are the folks who help uh, humanitarian organizations get the licenses they need to bring humanitarian aid to other countries. Um, so some of them will probably already be sympathetic. At the end of the day, um, the calls to OFAC are less about building sympathy and it's more to show that American taxpayers are actually paying attention to the fact that uh, the Treasury Department um, has yet to suspend sanctions at this time. Um, now, when you're calling a member of Congress, though, that's when you want to do the hearts and minds type of message. Um, so similar to OFAC, you want to make sure to express that you want the United States uh, to be suspending sanctions during the pandemic. Um, but you should, when you're making a call as a constituent to your uh, member of Congress, you should always be speaking from your heart. You should always be expressing the concern that you actually, as a, a voter, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, as green card, whoever you are, as someone that they represent, something that you are deeply personally affected by. So if you're directly impacted by sanctions or your family are directly impacted by sanctions, you should say that over the phone. Um, if you are an ally, like you're not Iranian American, but you're just very concerned about US foreign policy and how it's aiding in this economic warfare during a global pandemic, you should mention that. But at the end of the day, um, the ask, you should always make sure to give the ask um, to have the United States uh, temporarily suspend sanctions um, to allow them to fight the coronavirus pandemic and then make sure to include some kind of personal appeal of why you personally are concerned about the fact that these sanctions are in place right now. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Facebar, in terms of the, your slideshow, uh, I, I, are they? Absolutely, sure. Uh, I can send those, that's, that's just uh, research studies. Uh, the, I will send those um, uh, slides out to you guys and you can just share them with everyone. And also, you can you guys can all, always uh, go ahead and um, and look at those uh, research articles that I uh, that I mentioned online. They're they're all available and they're fairly easy to understand. Okay, so people will will be able to get that if they if they want it. Thanks very sure. much. Um, next question is about uh, the fact that the U.S. is sanctioning a number of countries, not just uh, Iran, but also Venezuela, Syria, and others. Um, would there be any possibility of, do you, do you think, I guess this is to Donna, of uh, uh, increasing opposition to sanctions by uniting uh, these different uh, efforts around these different countries that are facing sanctions? Yeah, um, so I will go ahead and say that um, at NIAC, we tend to focus on US-Iran foreign policy. So this is not a conversation that internally as an organization we've been having. But I know we've been in conversations with other um, in different coalition partner groups where this, this actually is the conversation, whether or not um, uh, grouping the countries together and talking about the total global impact would be more impactful than just talking about each individual country at a time. Um, I don't have an answer 
Um, I personally um, think that, you know, the more that you can show global impacts, the more impactful the policy can be. But the different sanctions put on each country, again, this is where the wand happens. They're all a little bit different. And they all impact the countries a little bit differently. So that's uh, typically, historically, that's part of the reason why a lot of these advocacy campaigns for lifting sanctions on each country have been separate advocacy campaigns. So don't have a, a total answer, but just know that those conversations are happening. Okay, thank you, Donna. The next is related to, that. is uh, Nayak or yourself available to go out and speak to community groups on these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are part of a community group that um, wants someone from NIAC to speak on a video call, uh, feel free to just reach out to me directly. I can put my um, email in the chat, but it's just Donna at NIACaction.org. I'll type it in the chat as well. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Faisbor, uh, there has been some uh, information lately that uh, the numbers uh, of infections and deaths in Iran have started to drop. Uh, do you, are you familiar with those, with those claims or what do you, what do you make of that? Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what particular source uh, they are referring to, but as far as I know, that has not been the case. So in fact, um, about a month ago, uh, the, the numbers were starting to drop. Uh, but then uh, the new year happened and then the government didn't do a good job in controlling uh, the social distancing policies and then the numbers started increasing again. And now about um, a week or two weeks ago, the government started opening some, uh, some businesses again, uh, which, which I think they, I guess they have to do because they can't really pay those, those people. Um, so, uh, so I don't think that um, that uh, that they have been dropping really. Right. Thank you. That's bad news. <laughs> um, so, how would uh, do either of you? Another question. Um, specifically, what would suspending the sanctions do in the short run? Would would it actually deal with this? crisis of testing and uh, lack of equipment and ability to uh, follow out the policy of social distancing? What, what, what impact would it have? Well, I think uh, it would be, this would be a really good question for Don also to answer because some, some people uh, claim that um, the Trump administration is actually allowing humanitarian help to Iran. Uh, that would be that would be a really uh, interesting question for Donna, I think, to answer because it's it's really a fallacy. So that's that's not true. That's 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 what uh, that's what is that what is being told uh, to us. But uh, but the reality is something else. But but to answer your question quickly, um, you know what really can be game changing for any country in this situation is having a higher capacity of testing. Uh, having having uh, a higher uh, you know ability to to test people quickly, uh, a large uh, part of the population. Um, so first of all, um, alleviating the sanctions will allow Iran will let you know, Iran to go ahead and purchase uh, many more of these uh, test kits in order to to do to do the tests. Um, and and you may say that uh, well, they do. They may have access to the, to to the test kits, but the question is really what what can be important in this case. And there has been some researches recently that that uh, that have shown this that the quality of the tests that are being done are also important. So you can't just go ahead and just purchase some test kits from somewhere. You have to make sure that you are purchasing these kits. From from good companies to make sure that the result that you're getting is proper. So it's it's really important to to keep that in mind. And then in addition to that, there are the medical technologies um, that that the hospitals and the ICU units are going to need, especially when they are flooded with uh, with patients in the next few months. Thank you, Donna. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, so I agree with everything that Dr. Faceport just said. Um, I only want to add. Um, so I think in addition to everything that was just said, um, 
there, there are two thoughts. One is that um, suspending sanctions will help uh, rebuild Iran's economy. So if you just think, I, I sometimes tell people to think about it in a US context, right? So right now you're seeing um, a lot of folks getting laid off from their jobs, right? There's a major economic impact to the coronavirus pandemic and people are worried about whether or not they have access to healthcare and medical supplies or even basic food or to even pay their rent. You know, the list goes on and on when you don't have, um, act, like you don't have a job, you don't have access to um, the, the ability to purchase the necessary goods you need to thrive. Um, when we are so severely impacting um, an economy of so many millions of people, um, you're impacting their ability to thrive. You're impacting their ability to buy like hygienic equipment, medicine, food for their own personal lives, right? It's not just about the hospitals, it's also about the individuals. Um, so by suspending sanctions that impact the economic sector, right? So this is why we say we don't wanna only suspend sanctions that impact you know, medical trade, right? We need to suspend sanctions on banking institutions to, to be able to open up trade. We need to suspend sanctions on the oil sector, which is a huge part of the Iranian economy and is a major contributor to jobs in the country. Um, so that's one thing, right? And then the other thing too is that uh, humanitarian aid workers are saying that they are very much struggling to be able to, to sufficiently bring in enough aid to tackle the crisis inside of Iran. Sure, maybe like Treasury has said that they have suspended certain sanctions, but in reality, a lot of these goods, because of the banking sanctions, are not able to come into Iran. Um, and then also the humanitarian workers who have licenses aren't able to bring in enough to be able to, you know, sufficiently tackle the crisis. They're restrained. Um, so by suspending sanctions, you'd be able to, to lift the shackles on humanitarian aid workers as well. Um, in addition to allowing Iran to, you know, open up its economy some more and to also increase trade, to be able to bring in uh, the medical equipment they need and the testing kits. Okay, great. Donna, there's another one for you. Can you provide more detail or sources for the past suspension of U.S. sanctions under Bush and Clinton? That is a really good question. Um, there is a really excellent article that... Um, is on responsible statecraft um, that Negar Mortazavi wrote very early on in the crisis that references back um, to these suspensions. So I highly recommend just checking out responsible statecraft and um, just type in Negar Mortazavi and you can see what she's written um, and you can read more about it there. Okay, could we get the, the correct spelling on that one, Brian, at some point? so that we can provide that. Um, then, um, Dr. Facebar, in terms of what's happening in Iran, um, is the uh, crisis located in particular areas of the country? Uh, for instance, is it concentrated in Tehran or is it everywhere? Are uh, different social classes being impacted differently uh, by the spread of the virus? Yeah, definitely. So um, there was, um, in fact, two weeks ago at the Iran Circle, we had a we had a meeting um, where we invited uh, one of the authors of uh, one of the papers that I was talking about, and also uh, another another scientist from Finland, who did a research on the effect of weather and climate on on the spread of the virus, and they showed that the, you know the weather does have some influences. But the influence of the weather is not going to be as much as we would hope. So that means that um, in the different areas of the country, there are some differences in Iran, but the, the differences are not that much because if the, the disease has already got so much out of control, then we, we can't really hope for the weather to fix it. It's, that's not going to happen. But there are certain areas of the country, such as the north, um, that, that have uh, more significant problems. I, I was actually talking to a friend of mine in, in a city named Amal in, in the north of Iran. And, uh, and he was saying that in, you can, you walk around in the streets and you see signs of, uh, signs about dead people on the walls all around you. So um, 
So yeah, there are uh, there there are many more of them in the areas that are more humid and and, and colder. Um, in the south, there is less cases, but uh, but this is this is pretty much everywhere. Of course, in the more populated areas like Tehran and the north and the northwest, uh, we have more of them. And then you also asked about the social class. Yeah, of course, you know if you you know the the more vulnerable people in the society are the ones that are going to be sacrificed here. You know, the, the lower class people, uh, those who can't really uh, easily uh, and get, you know, um, stay home and stay isolated and, and, and you know, um, and do all of those things. Those are the ones that are going to be to be sacrificed at the end of the day. So, you know, the, the, the middle class and the more the wealthier people uh, can just stay home for a long time but not everyone can do that in iran it's not it's not like here uh, that the government uh, would eventually be wealthy enough to to pay people for a, for a few months um, not not to say that the trump administration has done great here but um, but in iran it's a it's a whole different deal people are not going to stay home thank you um next question would be for either one of you i think uh, and what is the role of China, Russia, Cuba, Western Europe? Are any of them providing assistance uh, regarding the spread of the virus to Iran? Is that for Donna or for me? I think both of you. Both of us. What, what, it's, you know, it's probably not something uh, that's very well known, but just what are your impressions on that? Um, well, I, as far as Donna probably also knows a bit uh, more about about this, uh, but what I know is that uh, the the, uh, the most powerful ally for Iran so far has been China, which um, which paradoxically is the reason that Iran is dealing with this problem right now. Uh, it's because uh, the, the the flights from China to Iran were not cancelled for a long time because Iran was had to. That was the only channel for the economy of the country to work, so they couldn't just cancel all the flights easily. Um, so I think they have been getting a lot of support uh, still from uh, uh, from China even after that. But uh, but maybe Donna more knows more about this. Thank you, Donna. Yeah. Um, so there there are a couple things that I know of, and and. Apologies, my um, my other policy colleagues definitely know more about the the international aid that's been going on than I do. Um, but a couple of things I do know. Um, the first is that the Swiss have set up a humanitarian channel uh, with Iran. Um, there has been a lot of criticism because the first um, uh, delivery that they did, they turned it into a big PR stunt. Um, so you know, there it, it isn't altruistic aid. Um, and then at the, at the same time, we're seeing um, a couple of European allies um, urging the U.S. to suspend sanctions. This isn't to say that they're providing direct aid to Iran. I think they're trying to figure out how to um, coax the United States. Um, so there are a couple of things that folks have done. One is, um, you know, the Trump administration got a slap on the wrist by the UK when they um, imposed new sanctions uh, the other month. Um, and I think the big thing has been um, Iran's IMF loan request. Um, a lot of our European allies have um, been pushing the US to agree to the IMF loan. Uh, unsuccessfully though, it seems like the United States is gonna vote no. Um, which it's important to know too that for this loan, the United States doesn't have explicit veto power, but it has enough of a vote share that essentially it works like a veto. Um, so it's it's a little sad to say, but you know, while it seems like Europe is trying to help, they haven't done so in a very major way, and and quite frankly, it's been a little unsuccessful in their ability to sway the Trump administration to. Um, pull back on their maximum pressure campaign. Okay. Um, I guess one last question to Dr. Faisepour. Uh, would you be uh, open to presenting uh, your, the type of information you're presenting, including uh, the graphs and the scientific research uh, to uh, 
grassroots community groups? Sure, of course. Um, I can also put you guys in connection with the authors of those re researches. I know some of them. Uh, and I, I think that um, they will also be happy to talk about these because they are also Iranians inside the US and they are just um, personally really concerned about the situation. Also, I think um, Nayak is going to have a really interesting program tomorrow. I don't know if you guys were going to announce that. Why don't we hear about that? Sorry. Um, yes. So um, for those who are interested in um, continuing a conversation about uh, coronavirus and U.S. foreign policy, uh, we are hosting a discussion with Congressman um, Malinowski tomorrow. Um, it's going to be also um, with our guest host, who is Sanam Anderlini, who is the founder of ICANN. Um, and quite frankly, is very brilliant and on, on foreign policy and peacemaking, international peacemaking as a whole. Um, unfortunately, it's at the same time I know as another MAPA webinar. It's at 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. Um, but if you go to our website, uh, if you go to niacouncil.org, which I can type in the chat as well and check out our event page, um, you can see the RSVP form. It's still open. Um, we're asking folks to submit questions for the congressman as well. Um, it's important to know that Congressman Malinowski is a NIAC Action endorsed candidate. So this is actually an event that we're hosting for NIAC Action members. Um, but if you want to attend, you can just check a box saying that you want to sign up for, as a member. It's free. You actually do get some voting power when we have board elections. So pretty cool. Uh, so if you're interested in um, hearing what the congressman has to say about U.S. foreign policy in relation to coronavirus, highly recommend you tune in 7 p.m. tomorrow. And will that be uh, videotaped? Will that be taped? Uh, yes, it will be recorded and we'll be posting it on our website, on social media, and on YouTube. Okay, so we can find that for, for people to come to our <laughs> webinar. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Highly recommend you guys go to the map <laughs> and then Watch our recording afterwards. <laughs> okay, Brian. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. We appreciate that. It's an embarrassment of riches when it comes to uh, webinars these days. Uh, but I, I just want to thank uh, our presenters, uh, Dr. Paez Poor and, and Donna Favard, for that for that fantastic program. Uh, it really uh, gave us um, a, a base uh, for the action that we need to take, uh, the, the reasons why we need to, to act now and, and the means to do so. Um, so just a few things that I want to uh, leave you with. Uh, we do have some upcoming webinars that uh, continue to touch on the sanctions in different parts of the world as well uh, tomorrow uh, with, with the Latin America Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts. We're gonna be hosting a, a webinar at 1 p.m. Uh, on increasing tensions with Venezuela, uh, including the sanctions, as well as uh, threats of direct military action and accusations of uh, narco-terrorism uh, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And that will be a, a very interesting conversation with Hector Figuerella, who's an activist uh, out in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and he is also uh, an EMT. So he is uh, a frontline worker in the, in the fight against the coronavirus. So that will be very interesting uh, to catch. And also at 7 p.m., the one that Donna just uh, uh, mentioned, we will be doing a webinar on Cuba and how they have been able to respond to the coronavirus uh, with formulating drugs and, and sending doctors uh, around the world uh, to battle the virus. Uh, so that will be at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. And links to all of these will be included in a follow-up video, uh, follow-up email, including uh, a recording of this video so you can share it with your friends. Uh, we'll also hope to link to the wonderful slides you saw at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, I also want to let you know uh, about an advocacy workshop that we have coming up uh, with uh, FCNL, uh, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, they're putting on an advocacy workshop on Monday, 
at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we'll send you the link to that as well. And you can practice uh, on ways to become a better uh, advocate in those meetings. Uh, as Donna said, it really helps to speak from the heart, and that's really what they're about over at FCNL. I've attended that training before, and it is definitely worthwhile uh, to, to change the mind of your representatives. We'll also be including uh, ways to get in touch with your rep, uh, phone numbers to call, uh, also that number over at the Treasury Department at uh, OFAC, uh, which I've already forgotten. I think it's the Office of uh, Foreign Asset Controls. That's right. That's right. I pulled that one out of there. Uh, but we'll be including a little script, too, uh, to help you along um, because we, we really need to uh, put pressure on the levers of power and, and let them know that we're paying attention uh, to what's going on and uh, we need to make our demands and make them clearly because time is of the essence. So I want to thank everyone for, for joining us. Uh, this has been uh, Mass Peace Action's uh, Middle East Working Group. Uh, webinar. We will have more to come. Uh, we'll, we'll link to this as well to our YouTube page where you can see all of our webinars, but, uh, but we, we encourage you to stay active at this time. We know everyone is, is staying home, but uh, we need to keep up the organizing. We need to keep up the action. We need to keep making our voices heard. Uh, that's the only way that we're going to achieve change the changes that we so so desperately need. So I want to thank everyone, uh, especially our panelists, but but all of our uh, attendees and audience members for tuning in tonight. Uh, stay tuned. Check out uh, the Mass Peace Action events page for upcoming webinars. Uh, we will be in touch with you. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox, and we will be sending you all the action items from the webinar tonight and ways that you can get and stay involved. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Donna Farrard and uh, Dr. Amin Fayez-Poor, uh, as well as Paul and Cole for helping to, to organize this. And we're gonna stay active, uh, but everyone stay safe. Uh, so thank we're you. signing off for now, but uh, we'll see you soon at the next one. All right, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Stay safe.